Welcome to Yousef ICEP, a weekly podcast with Northern Lights Winery founder Doug Bell, exploring the experiences from leaders in business, social media, and family. Now here's this week's exceptional guest. Welcome to Yousef ICEP. My name is Doug Bell, the host of the podcast, and uh, I'm really excited to have a good friend here, Jason, from Six Sigma. It's a production company. They do incredible videography uh, work, and uh, I, I can I wouldn't hesitate to say that if you are a local in Prince George, you've probably seen some of their stuff out there because you have a really interesting portfolio of kind of short film as well as a lot of stuff you do with businesses. And I'm really excited to get into that later on. You also are big into the dirt biking scene. And I've seen some of the videos, like they're incredible. Like you're like the extreme sport to do that everybody wants to be friends with. Uh, so I'm really excited to talk about that. And uh, before we kind of get into that, uh, we're sipping a little bit. It's a morning here in Prince George, BC, where we're uh, recording this. So I'm doing a little bit of wine since I'm the wine guy drinking our Ursa wine, which is an apple wine made from local apples. You are drinking some delicious local coffee. And uh, we're going to check out uh, uh, a lot of interesting things along the way today. Um, But before we get uh, into what you're doing right now, um, I I think behind any, you know, videographer, there's probably some really interesting stories about when you were younger, how you got interested in uh, what you're doing now. Maybe you can kind of give us your origin story. What did you start out with? I was, I'm born and raised in Prince George here. And um, when it comes to the videography side, uh, or literally having a camera in my hands, that probably dates back to when I was four or five. Um, (laughs) My parents had the big over the shoulder VHS camera. Yeah, the big heavy ones. Yeah, yeah. Probably I have like spina bifida from being a kid walking around with it on my shoulder. Um, (laughs) But it was, yeah, from the time I was probably four or five, I was always filming something. Um, Lots of just like, completely random little mini short film things or little comedy sketches um obviously a lot of sports stuff you know you watch your heroes uh on on the screen riding dirt bikes or hitting mountain bike jumps or whatever and we would take the cameras out and do that and so um yeah i kind of did that up until i was probably around 12 or 13 and then Mm -hmm. my family moved and when we moved into our new house the kid next door was really into skateboarding and he actually probably three or four years older than me. And he actually had, he knew how to get the stuff from the camera onto a computer, which I had never done. Like everything that I would do before was always, you would just film it and then you'd put the VHS in and be like, nice, I've made a video. (laughs) Whereas all of a sudden now this opened up this whole new opportunity. So we got like a Firewire cable. And from that point on, it was like no looking back. So probably from the time I was 12, then I could actually learn kind of the editing craft and, and actually make real end products. So I was making dirt bike edits and ski edits. Um, and then lots of like short film stuff with my friends. And, uh, yeah, I did that all the way, uh, all the way through high school. Um, you know, up until like when I was in university, I was still kind of dabbling a little bit, Uh um, in university and in late high school, I was really into like skiing, like freestyle skiing. And so again, for me, any sport that I did always had this like filming aspect to it. Um, yeah. I was never really big into like competing. It was always more on the like the video side of making and, and showing what you were doing through video. Yeah. And so, um, yeah, that's actually how I met my business partner, Glenn, was he was at the Heart Ski Hill. I was at the Heart Ski Hill. And <laughs> all of a sudden there's this kid that skis past and he has a camera and I'm immediately intrigued. <laughs> so I rolled down, I'm like, introduce myself and then we kind of exchanged details a little bit and I went on to, at the time there was this website called new schoolers, which was like a skiing forum thing before social media. And all of a sudden there's this kid that I'm looking at online who I just met and he's got like all of his own, he's been doing the exact same thing his whole life that I've been doing. So I'm like, this is awesome. And he could like, he was doing some editing stuff that I didn't really know how to do. And so I'm like really excited about that. So then from there, it just turned into this friendship of, Hey, you film me skiing. I film you skiing. Let's literally go all over the province and film skiing together. So yeah, we were doing that, uh, pretty much nonstop. And, and then, um, yeah, kind of towards the end of university, I actually went to UMBC and I have a bachelor of commerce with a major in human resources. And 
the filming stuff was always kind of just like a fun thing that we were doing. I never really thought too much from a business side of it. Um, but kind of towards the end of university, uh, somebody who was doing a little bit of marketing consulting work had seen some of our ski stuff and they're like, Hey, you know what? You guys could probably have a go at it. Like if you, if you wanted to make some commercial content, I bet you could make a little business. And so, uh, we obviously didn't have a portfolio that in any way reflected commercial stuff. It was literally <laughs> just like punk kids skiing and like destroying public property on handrails and stuff. Yeah. And so they, the gentleman, uh, do you know, Matt Blake? Yeah. Yeah. So Matt, Matt, uh, was like, I have this client, they're a CrossFit gym in town. Obviously you don't have a portfolio, they're not gonna pay you. But if you wanna roll in, you can make something and just you know, see where it goes. Yeah. So Glenn and I rolled up and kind of got the 10 minute version of what the hell is CrossFit and <laughs> filmed a couple classes and put together this video. And it honestly just snowballed from there. So that was kind of in late or mid 2013. Um, yeah. I was just getting ready to graduate and, um, yeah, we, we made this thing and everyone was really receptive to it. And there was actually a couple of clients who were going to the gym. Uh, one guy who was uh, the finance manager at Northland Dodge, he's, he's like, Hey, that was awesome. Can you make me something? I want to get like a little intro to who I am. Yeah. So we're like, okay. <laughs> so he gave us 500 bucks and we go and probably probably ended up working for like three cents on the dollar. Like we put in so much effort on it and didn't know what we were doing, but we made that. And then uh, lo and behold, the dealer principal, Brent Marshall, he, he saw it and he said, Hey, I want this for all my clients, you know, send me a quote. We'll get you set up as a, as a vendor, yada, yada. And it was like, okay, well this is real now. Like we can't just do a little cash transaction. <laughs> and so that kind of was the, the kickoff point for Six Sigma where it was a matter of let's, you know, register the business. And we, so we kind of really did things pretty ass backwards as far as no business plan, no real idea of what we were getting into. It was just like, yeah. Hey, there's an opportunity. We're used to being broke students. Let's just yeah. be broke business owners kind of thing. <laughs> uh, and yeah, that was in, that was, I think we registered the company in April of 2014 wow. and uh, have kind of been going from there. So you started out kind of doing maybe a classy version of Jackass, right? Sitting, you know, and, and you probably had a lot of idols that you were watching that had done similar things, but it was really just a hobby. And there, there are a lot of people listening right now that maybe they have a lot of passions and they have a lot, a lot of side projects that they do, but they work in another industry because that's what pays the bills. You kind of went backwards where you found something you were super passionate about and it just so happened that people wanted to pay you for it. That, that must be like a, you know, you must feel pretty proud of that. I mean, what was like the emotion like when someone actually just approached you and said, I want to pay you for this thing that you probably would be willing to do for free. Yeah, it was, it was awesome. You know, it was, it was really cool. And it was, I think at the time, um, and even looking back on it now, um, I don't, we, we weren't particularly brave in our endeavor. You know, like I said, we were, we were broke. We're both come from very fortunate lifestyles and families and all this stuff. So we like, didn't have a ton of risk in firing up this company. Yeah. You know, there's a lot of people, like you said, who have this passion or this side thing that they would love to be able to do but they have all of the realities of a mortgage and kids or a real salary thing with benefits and this. And like the people that actually take a step away from those areas that are like those sorts of lifestyles to start and go and do their own thing. I'm like, those people are gnarly. That's like a <laughs> real, a real endeavor. Um, but yeah, it's, it's kind of coming back to your question. It's still, it's still to this day trips me out for somebody to kind of show any form of respect or admiration around what we do. Yeah. Um, whether it's, you know, something short and quick for Instagram and you just get like this business owner who's like, this is so awesome. And you know, it shows us so well, or, you know, it's a, a full on documentary or something where people yeah. come to us and say like, you know what, this really impacted how I literally look at the world. It's to this day, like no matter what we make, you're still super proud of it, which is cool. Will you bring emotion from the screen into people's living rooms or, or into their, onto their phones or wherever they're watching you. And I, I think that's something that, that real true filmmakers do. 
is that they don't just produce something on a technical aspect. What I've always experienced with your products is that you're actually hitting me emotionally, right? And so when I watch something, I can feel it. It's, you know, the music and the, the shot visuals and the directions things are coming from in the transitions and the, and the, the way that the words come across the screen really are impactful for me. And, and I feel like I'm there, right? I feel like I'm in the moment with somebody. And one of the things that you uh, do, um, of course, is, is a lot of shots with like the dirt biking, which is another huge passion of yours. Um, how did, maybe can you tell me a little bit about when you got started with dirt biking? Because you're obviously, you're a skier, you're a skateboarder, um, you know, you do a lot of things, but dirt biking is something that you've done at a fairly high level as well. One thing that's kind of funny, and this, this does tie in nicely to, you know, the background of skateboarding, skiing, dirt biking, all of that stuff. And then kind of where we've been able to find ourselves with the company, as far as actual storytellers, um, there's for lack of a better term in all of these different sports, like skiing, for example, there's kind of the term with ski movies where it's like, this is just ski porn. This is literally just like people hitting rails or hitting jumps or skiing big lines or whatever. There's very often either no story or some sort of kind of superficial in the first five minutes of the film where it's like, oh, this mountain is your canvas and whatever, right? It doesn't matter. But um, the thing is that growing up, that's all you're kind of watching, both Glenn and I. And that's where in growing our team, we've been able to actually make Six Sigma so much stronger and make ourselves better filmmakers because we've brought in people on our team who come from a completely different lens. Like our main director, uh, Daniel Stark, he didn't grow up watching. I mean, he watches like skate videos and stuff when you're in high school, because like we all were, but he was films, you know, like studying the art of filmmaking. And um, what he was able to do is bring in this mindset of like, hey, if we're gonna make a dirt bike thing, how do you make me who literally doesn't, or how do I make Dan who does not care about dirt biking, mm -hmm. care about this dirt biking film that you're gonna try to make, right? Because a bunch yeah. of flashy shots isn't gonna be what does it. Mm -hmm. um, a few years ago, we produced a seven part outdoor adventure sport documentary called Hidden Heroes. Yeah. And it was essentially covering local athletes who were doing these things at really high levels, but pretty much under the radar. And that was one of the big lessons and things that he was instilling in our whole team at the time was like, I do not care about fly fishing. Like make me care about this guy who's fly fishing. The, the sport he's doing is completely irrelevant. I need to know why I care about that person. And so that's, it's kind of a, a rule or an unwritten kind of code of everything that we approach. Like, you know, this past fall creating, uh, we were shooting some project, a project here at the winery and it's like, yeah, we can just have a bunch of clips of the winery, but we need to care about those people who are on screen, even though they're not even saying anything. Like, why do we emotionally invest in what they're doing? So, I don't know, a bit of a, bit of a tangent, but I think that's yeah. kind of an interesting thing that, um, you know, surrounding yourself with really good people who are better at things that you're not good at is so important because without Dan, probably Six Sigma's growth would be stunted in the fact that we wouldn't have come in with as much of that kind of approach to putting as much importance on storytelling. Yes, discipline and storytelling and, and having a beginning, a middle, and an end maybe. Yeah. But So uh, it's really interesting because you're connecting a lot of dots for me right now in terms of talking about how storytelling is important on the visuals, but you're not actually talking or you're not storytelling about the place you're in, you're storytelling around the people. And so like, what are some of the ways that you, or tricks of the trade maybe, if they're not too secret, that you can kind of, where in some cases, there's maybe not even any words coming out of someone's mouth, but you can actually connect that person so we care about them as the main character of the story. One of the things that we've kind of learned over the years that, um, and I don't know how well I'm gonna be able to kind of articulate it, but the the biggest thing that we see in so many cases is you know you'll meet with a client or you'll you'll be brain brainstorming some sort of project and everyone wants to tell everything like as a, as a client you want to get your most bang for your buck so you need to know this is when we are open this is when this this is when that um, but if we come in at 
come into a project with a focus on story and then really think about the idea of what is a commonality amongst everyone. And ultimately, the, the thing that kind of joins us all together is kind of those emotional cues or those states of being that we've all at one point or another shared with each other. And so that's a bit of the approach of, you know, what, what mindset or what state of being do we want to capture the audience in? Uh, and then how do we reflect that through the visuals? So if we want the audience to feel hopeful, if we want them to feel, you know, sad or, um, you know, excited or whatever that might be, you, you make then all of the creative decisions around that very, very like common thing that we've all experienced, which is some form of emotion. So emotion brings together people and, and you're really careful about how you do that. And so, so um, to be a bit of a nerd here, get into it when you're showing it. How, so if I want someone to feel sad, um, I know personally, like if you, if I'm slumping my shoulders, if I'm kind of hunching over, that would be like a visual cue that I'm sad. I know that for physical for people, how do you show that on the camera? Like someone being sad versus hopeful versus elated versus something else. So within every role of filmmaking, so, you know, you have your director, you have your director of photography or camera person, but then you have your editor and your sound person and your special, like everyone, if they all know this particular shot needs to feel sad or hopeless or lonely, everyone can bring their skill set into that particular visual in order to actually achieve that that feeling. So, you know, the director is going to work with the person on screen to say, you know, this is how I need you to kind of be acting or feeling. The director of photography is going to choose a frame that maybe, you know, makes things feel if they're sad because they feel alone, you want to make them feel like they're in a big empty space. You know, you want your editor to maybe cut sooner or later to make things feel, you know, more hopeless. If you, if you leave the frame up for a couple extra seconds, maybe it feels awkward and, and more lonely or whatever. You reduce right? the colors or yeah, you sat, you desaturate the colors. Like there's all of, all of those sorts of decisions. And those decisions are happening with every single frame in every single thing that you try to make ideally. It's that's such a skill and an art and, and you're kind of coming together uh, in a way. I mean, a lot of those things may not even be teachable, but uh, how did you know you were good at it? Like, what was what was like, was there a moment when you were growing up and you were you showed something to somebody when you were four you know, and they said, wow, like this is this is actually something special. I don't think um, I ever had one of those moments where it was like, you're amazing at this. But I think ultimately what it boils down to is like, you need reps. And as, as a filmmaker, as our entire team, so there's four people on our team now, we didn't all know each other until let's say four or five years ago when we kind of, at, at that point, that was this four person team. Up until that point, and up until all of us kind of met each other, we were all getting reps completely on our own. You know, I'm out at the dirt bike track, just filming my brother, trying mm -hmm. angles, you know, trying to replicate the things that we see. Dan has all of his friends and they're just making short film after short film after short film. Glenn's doing the same with his skiing. Christos is shooting photography like it's going out of style <laughs> and you're just getting reps. And actually one of the things that I see now, which is just honestly like a, a kind of a bummer. And I think when we were kids, we had this luxury that you could make simply for the sake of making. Like I said, for the first six years of me doing it, we would literally just film, put it in the VHS, and like me and my brother would watch it raw on the VHS <laughs> and be like, this is sick. Yeah. But we weren't making it for likes. We weren't making it for the engagement or for what anyone saw. And I think that's a thing that unfortunately stunts a lot of like, um, youth right now and, and new people into this craft or honestly into like any of it mm -hmm. is that there's kind of this shift that's happened in everyone's brainwaves where it's like, I shouldn't, I don't make something unless I'm making it for others. So I think the thing that you see, and I have, I'll have conversations like I, I probably field, you know, a call a month from some kid in high school or some, 
you know, person who's interested in getting into filmmaking, looking for opportunities or looking for guidance. And that's the thing that I tell them every single time. Like, oh, what are you making? And it's always, you know, pause. Well, I haven't really made anything. Yeah. And it's like, okay, why? And I I think just based on all these conversations that I've had, because people never really have a good reason. There's like, I I don't know. It's like, you have a cell phone. There's your camera. That camera is like, 30 times better than what I ever had with my like crappy little high eight thing. Yeah. Um, you know, you just literally need to be getting reps, yeah. but, and I try to tell people it does not matter. Like make a hundred things. And by the hundred thing, it's going to be like one tick above complete garbage. Yeah. Right. And because, yeah, I think just people get so hung up on the need to be making for others rather than the need to be making just for the sole goal of getting better. Like I'm a firm believer that anything that I do, whether it's, uh, you know, filmmaking, whether it's the riding that I do like dirt biking, um, I should be able to look back three or six months in the past and see what I was doing at that time Mm -hmm. and feel like I've, I've made a, an improvement. It doesn't have to be a drastic improvement, but feel like I need to be making an improvement. We should be able to look at a film that we, you know, produced yeah, a year ago. And yeah, you can still be proud of it given the circumstances of that time. Mm-hmm. But if six months ago, that's still the best thing that you've ever made, like you have a problem. You need to do something to kind of change course because you're not kind of making that advancement. Yeah. And that's just what it boils down to is reps. Like if I think of how many times I've pressed record or whatever or how many times i've jumped up over a log it's like you literally just need those reps in order to improve and you need to be doing those things just for yourself not for the satisfaction of others giving a crap yeah i mean that's really important because for many people we talk about uh things we're good at and things we enjoy and what i found is that uh when i grew up everybody wanted to be an athlete right? Or they wanted to be uh, an astronaut or they wanted to be maybe the prime minister of Canada. But today, uh, those things aren't what we value. Uh, I mean, athletes to some degree, but what we're actually valuing is the affirmation or the feeling we believe we're going to get when people, uh, when, when we're successful at something. And so there's this fear because people want to jump from zero to hero mm-hmm. and they don't want to stay, take the steps in between. Before the podcast, uh, we were talking about uh, our journey on LinkedIn, and it's interesting uh, that you're talking about these reps and the practice because uh, one of the goals I had at the beginning of the year was to post every day on LinkedIn, and I wasn't going to look, and I won't look back until the end of the calendar year. And after 365 or so posts, I'll look back and say, "What did I do at the beginning? What am I doing now? And am I improving?" And I believe that uh, that anything is a skill. Now, having said that, some people are meant to be an NHL star and some people aren't. And you can get better at hockey, but you still can't get to that elite status. And uh, in today's day and age with TikTok and Instagram and LinkedIn and Facebook and all of these, pla- YouTube and all these platforms out there, there's this desire to do, to get on screen and to do these things. Um, so how do you balance like the, the, the need and desire for the affirmation, which is, can be a really me- uh, strong mental health issue with the acknowledgement and the emotional intelligence to understand, you know, am I good at this? Can I, can I actually do this and be successful at it? Yeah. So two things I'll get to the idea of like being successful. And I think what that needs to mean for people, or at least for me, what that means, but coming taking a step back to the idea of affirmation and getting, getting likes, getting praise, all of that sort of stuff. So about, I would say about two and a half years ago, my business partner, Glenn, who's like insane on a mountain bike, like a Mm -hmm. complete madman. He was having a little bit of success with the growth of his Instagram. And in doing that in action sports, what that tends to mean is you start to get more support from brands. You're paying for less. You're getting little mini, you know, travel salaries, like, yeah, you're kind of in your own roundabout way, having like a go of it as an athlete, you yeah. know? Um, and so, you know, I saw what he was doing and I thought to myself, okay, I've kind of been plunking around with this Instagram stuff with the dirt biking. 
I'm going to give it one last shot and just see what that, see what that does if I truly try to give it, give it a go. And so, yeah, about two years ago, I started posting pretty frequently, really trying to understand the algorithm, understand how to essentially trick the algorithm and, um, you know, started to see some growth and then you'd have these spurts of more and more growth. And so now it's at the point where, um, I'll actually never forget the first time that I had a post kind of like go viral. It was, it got probably like 800 likes or something, but I remember sitting on the couch and being like, damn, like my phone just like keeps, I'm like sick. This is like, this is doing a thing. Yeah. Um, but what ends up happening, it's, it's no different than, you know, you hear the the term like chasing the dragon or whatever, right? Where you're doing drugs and it's your, your first high is your best high with whatever you do. And, um, it's to the point now with my following and with everything that's happening on my Instagram, where if I don't get a post that at this point gets like 1500 likes, I'm like, ah, shit, like it didn't do very well. Mm -hmm. And you have that same sense of feeling like you didn't, you did something wrong or whatever you, you know what I mean? And I, I'm very conscious of it and I try to manage that, uh, that whole thought process and, and remind myself, you know what, it was, it's likely a, an issue with the algorithm. You didn't post at the right time or, you know, people just didn't see it and engage early enough and it kind of stalled itself out. And I try to remind myself of that, but it's like not a healthy thing at all. So, I mean, you're, you're negatively uh, impacting your emotional state, even though 90% of people would consider that their best post yeah, ever. Like, this is insane, right? Yeah. So, how, how do you come down from that, right? Because that, that can really negatively affect your life if, if you allow it to. Yeah. And so what I try to do is just remind myself that in the end, boiling, bringing it all the way back to that idea of making stuff for the sake of you making stuff that you think is cool. I want to be my like number one fan, not in an egotistical way, but in a way of I want to be able to look back on this when my body's all beat up and decrepit in like 15, 20 years and be like, hopefully longer than 15, 20 years. We'll see. I don't know. But be like, that was a sick day. Like, I remember being scared to like do that jump or hit that thing or whatever. And like, that was rad. And I remember so-and-so was there that day. And if I can bring it back to that point um, mentally, when those things don't perform well, or even when they do perform well, it needs to boil back down to that idea that I'm making for the sake of myself and enjoying the process of making, not the process of getting the likes and the affirmations and everything. So have you found that as you've uh, become more successful uh, on Instagram and within your own business and you doing things that you love so much to do, has, has it ever hit you and you taken you back and said, you know, uh, it feels more like a job now than something that I'm really passionate about. Because I always fear, you know, people, a lot of, a lot of people fear getting into something that they love so much because then it, it may become uh, detrimental to their overall mental health. Right. Yeah. It's a, it, both, both things have at times and do at times feel like a job. Like they're going out, knowing that you don't have like four or five clips that you can rely on and be like, oh, I need to post today because that's, <laughs> You know, because now it's to a point where there's like sponsors and obligations and people expect things in return for things. And so I need to, you know, it's pouring rain and I know I don't have a clip for tomorrow. It's like, okay, I'm going to go ride. And like, yeah, there's times when it feels like a job. There's there's times every single day because, again, coming back, there's probably 95% of the population surface level. Oh, you, you make videos for a living. God, that's gotta be awesome. And like, yeah, it's way better than like what a lot of people have to do for work for <laughs> sure. But it still comes with a ton of stress and it comes with a ton of, uh, you know, mental strain and being physically exhausted and all of these things. Like it, it still feels like a job. Um, but I guess again, if we're, I remember getting a piece of advice and I, I didn't get a piece of advice. I was at the uh, film festival in Vancouver and they were interviewing a director up on like a board. And he said, as a filmmaker, if your goal is to, is to gain your, um, your happiness out of the outcome, you're never, ever going to find that. Like, he's like, when I directed my first Hollywood feature film, we wrapped on that or I saw it on the big screen at the premiere. And it's not a matter of like, 
cool, I've done this now. Now I can move on. It's just like, you want more, you need more. And so what he was, his recommendation was, was enjoying the process of it. Yeah. Enjoying, again, kind of coming back to that idea of like living in the moment and being just happy with the things that you're able to do at any given day, uh, rather than thinking that you're going to chase something that's really truly going to bring you anything. Because in the end, yeah, like we've, we've made documentaries, we've been able to do these big, cool, elaborate commercial shoots. And it's like, yeah, it's, it's fun in the moment. But if we think that just getting to do that is going to be what is the end game, it's like, can't be. Yeah. And, and so that's, that's interesting you say, and I think that when that'll connect with a lot of people, um, who are doing things that they really love or not, uh, or doing things maybe that they don't is that you, you're in an industry, uh, where it's, it's very interesting because you connect and you complete a project, right. And then you get that short term high of having, you know, seeing the end result and it's just beautiful and the work is great. And then you can see the emotions of the people who are watching it. And then you got to start that all over again. So you kind of go through maybe waves of emotions of highs and lows, whereas in traditional work, you, you might be a little more consistent. And so you don't necessarily get the highs, you don't get the lows. Is that like uh, taxing on you mentally? Like, that just seems like it would be, uh, it would be a very emotional job. Yeah, it, that's actually a really, that's a good way of kind of uh, explaining it because it's exactly that, right? You're on this roller coaster of, you know, you're, you're all stressed out for weeks on end in the lead up to, you know, some tourism based shoot where it's just like everything feels terrible and you're just mad at the world. You're mad at everyone and everything. And then all of a sudden you get this moment where you're at the top of this mountain and the sun is absolutely like firing and like everything just comes together. And then, you know, you go back in and you're editing and certain thing that you got in the interview isn't working or whatever. And so you, yeah, you're riding this much more roller coaster of a thing. Whereas I think a lot of people, you have the, the high moments are a lot less high. Um, but I think there's a lot more security and there's a lot more things that make those low moments a lot less low. There's a lot less riding on certain things or decisions that you're making. And I think, um, the actually first time that I had that described to me was, we were, we were working on a project with a former professional snowmobile racer. And I mean, in his world at the time of racing snowmobiles professionally, which seems to so many people is like the most obscure random thing, but <laughs> as somebody who grew up around it, I'm like, yeah, that's sick. That's yeah. awesome. In, in British Columbia, there's a lot of, yeah, a lot of awesome snowmobile riders for sure. Yeah. So he kind of explained to, to me or us as part of this project we were working on with him it was that same sort of thing where when he retired, you're stepping off of this roller coaster of a win. You can win one weekend and shatter your pelvis the next weekend and be down and out for a half a year or a year, right? Like it's this crazy thing. And then he moves back to Prince George and buys this business and then is kind of just like cruising. And you're on this kind of slow linear climb with the odd dip and rise. And it was really hard for him mentally to kind of deal with that. I don't know how true this is or like if there's any sort of fact checking that would be required but the way that i always think of things is like if i can be aware of the issues that i'm likely facing with regards to being aware of the mental health struggles that could come with that like highs and lows lifestyle it's at least one step closer to being able to manage it because i'm aware that it exists rather than just kind of being oblivious and like i don't know why my life sucks and it's like <laughs> well probably this thing man you know so yeah you, you seem like you have really high uh, emotional intelligence like you understand um yourself very very well like you've clearly thought about this and uh recently uh you went to four day uh week work weeks um with your company and you, you kind of came up with a new methodology of how you wanted to live your life and how you wanted your employees to live, to be able to live their lives. Can you talk a little bit about that and, and, and maybe why, how that came up about? I'm very fortunate that my business partner and I are in the moments when we need to be are on the exact same page. And in the moments when we need to be are completely different pages to kind of keep each other in check. And we meet Obviously, we speak literally every morning together in some capacity about what's going on. And quarterly, we come together and we, we kind of gauge and do a temp check on like where things are at. And 
he had made a comment out one morning when we were doing these quarterly check-ins that was just kind of like, you know, what are your thoughts on maybe going to a four day work week? Like at least in some capacity, it's not going to be perfect. And at this point, yeah, it's not perfect at all. Um, but what are your, yeah, what are your thoughts on that? And I was kind of feeling a bit of burnout and a bit of stress around, um, yeah, we've kind of, I think all naturally fall into this, into this kind of like archaic way of thinking. It's just like, that's the way our parents did it. That's the way everyone has kind of done it over however many years is like yeah. nine to five, you know, <laughs> or eight thirty to four thirty, whatever it is you want to do. And, um, yeah, so we kind of said to ourselves, okay, well, right now is not a good time. Like this was probably in September and typically what happens September, October is always really crazy for us because we're trying to get as much captured before that like season up in Northern BC where everything just looks dead and decrepit. And so we're just crushing out filming, working probably, you know, 55, 60 hours a week just to get everything done. And then we said, okay, you know, at the start of November, we're going to make that transition. So we talked to the team and I think it's important one of the things for us was that we needed to have some other measure of are we still going to be able to achieve our goals and so um, in all of our financial models and our projections and stuff instead of basing it solely on everyone's working 40 hours a week we tie a lot more of what we're doing into uh, our billable percentage rates. Like we track, we started tracking time for our company in 2015 and it's like track now to a T. Like at my, yeah. at my computer right now, there's a non-billables thing that says podcast with Doug. Yeah. You know, going. <laughs> and so we track billables and we also track that on average over the duration of a full year, we want to be able to average 35 hours a week. So that's going to give us, you know, roughly 30 hours a week on those slower times. And then we're probably going to be up in the 50, 55 hours a week when things are slamming in the middle of summer. And so, yeah, that's kind of what we've tried to do. And it's funny when I first put that post on LinkedIn, yeah. the very next week, I don't think I've had a Friday where I like didn't at least work in some capacity. Like, I kind of jinx myself. <laughs> like, ah, dang it. Yeah. But what it has done is it's at least given us all just kind of like a little bit of uh, a little bit of breathing room as far as like that expectation that we have to be in the office on that Friday or whatever. It's kind of alleviated that a little bit. Um, so now I'm able to, yeah, whatever. I can open up my laptop on Friday morning do a sprint for like an hour and just get a bunch of stuff off my plate yeah. and then not feel like I have to be worried about, it. I can go dirt biking, you know, Glenn can go and have his weekend trip skiing or whatever anyone wants to do. Um, and yeah, you kind of, it's never going to be perfect. Like I said, so plenty of, you know, we're going to have Friday off, but guess what? We shoot on Saturday this week yeah. because just of the logistics and how everything shook out Saturday was going to be the day that worked. So yeah, it's just more, I think about, trying to find a bit of a balance and one of the things that my my dad he was an entrepreneur for ever still to a degree is mm -hmm. I mean, my brother pretty much looks after his company now but um remember having a conversation with him maybe two years ago and just getting the cold hard facts of like owning a business sucks and so if you're not going to be getting like any sort of benefit out of it like, what the hell are you doing? Go get a salary and like have a super cushy life and not worry about work when work's over. Yeah. I'm like, damn, that's like, literally I'm, I'm doing the worst of both worlds now where I'm dealing with all this stress. I'm carrying all of these things, but I'm still, for some reason, putting up this like fake construct around me that I have to be at the office every day, or I have to be doing these things that are just kind of like hard baked into our culture. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, him saying that was a bit of a wake up call to be like, yeah, like yeah. if I'm going to deal with all the BS that comes with it, find ways to create cooler opportunities for yourself yeah. uh, outside of it. Many people really feel that entrepreneurship is all about the glory and the fame and the money. But the fact is that 98% of entrepreneurs never make any more money than they would if they were working for some someone else. Yeah. And you've clearly identified something and you've been uh, intelligent enough to be able to articulate it. Wanna, when you start to think about being an entrepreneur versus just being an employee, um, there's very different pressures in the businesses, right? And 
Uh, how do you how do you balance that and kind of say like even to the degree of I want to expand my business or I'm happy with the size that it is right now? Um, I think that would be really valuable for people to hear because uh, many people just go 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 and they they can never find the top of the mountain and they're not any happier uh, with their life because of that. Yeah, well, I mean, I think come back like I was saying, you know, if you're gonna get would you rather have 35 Instagram likes from 35 people who you truly deeply care about and have positive relationships with? Or would you rather have 2000 Instagram likes and you're like, sick, like even my wife blocked me. Now she doesn't care or whatever. Right? <laughs> Not that, no, my wife hasn't blocked me yet. But um, it's, it's kind of that idea of as an entrepreneur, uh, do you want to chase the dragon? And is that what's is that what is driving success for you and your idea of like, what is the definition of success? Or, um, you know, do you have a clearly identified version of what that success is that may not be the construct of, you know, money, fame, power, all of these things. And for me, a lot of the way that I look at it, and I think I'm fortunate that the way that, you know, Glenn looks at it and the rest of our team looks at it is it's not, we're never going to get rich making making videos or making films like realistically there's way easier ways to make a lot more money um and so we put up with all of the hecticness and all the stress that comes with it because it pays us dividends in other ways and i think as an entrepreneur you're afforded it's funny you probably deal with like more crap and like more stress but you're in a cool position where in the end the things that you're dealing with, you actually do have the power to change Mm -hmm. versus a lot of people. Yes, maybe they carry a lot of stress and they carry a lot of things that are a pain in the butt about their careers and their work. Um, Maybe it's not at as high of a level, but guess what? In a lot of times their hands are tied and they don't necessarily have the power to make any of those changes. Mm -hmm. So you kind of put up with that added layer, but in the end, you're really the only one to blame for whatever decisions that you've kind of made or, you know, you kind of make your own bed a little bit. Right. So we've kind of found ourselves in a position now where we've, we've, yeah, obviously come to terms with the size that we are maybe isn't perfect and the, the format that we have, our workflow, none of it is ever going to be perfect. It's always going to need some sort of continuous improvement. Yeah. Um, but we're not necessarily chasing anything other than like happiness in the moment and, enjoying that process of whatever it is that we're doing. Yeah. Because if you're just slogging through the now in hopes that tomorrow is going to be better, (laughs) it is not going to be, you know, you have to just be stoked on what you're doing, like in that moment, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Entrepreneur Gary Vee always likens uh, entrepreneurship to being a firefighter, firefighter, where you're basically just putting out fires and that's, that is your job. Um, Of course, you've got a nice size and, and, and in terms of your company where you're out actively working in the company as well. And it's afforded you the ability to do projects and maybe um, keep your company doing projects that are more interesting to you. And you found like a nice niche within, uh, within the community of, of the types of projects you, you undertake. Can you tell me a little bit about how that came about and how you choose the the work? Cause you really actually have gotten to such a success level where you get to choose what you do. So when we started, it was Glenn and I, and then we were, we actually negotiated and we were in the process of negotiating this big project that I'm so thankful to this day that we never got because it would have completely put us on a horrendous trajectory of Bummerville. And so <laughs> we didn't get this contract, but in the lead up to that, we hired our first employee and then we hired another employee. And we actually spent probably the first four and a half, five years of our business kind of growing, but again, growing in a way where it was, we were busy for the sake of being busy. Like we weren't making any more money. I remember meeting with the accountants and it was at the end of the worst year of six, eight, like as far as just stress. And I was like, man, we were so busy today. Like that was crazy. And they're like, you made $5,000 more than last year. Yeah. Just because you had so much inefficiency and so many hiccups and all of these things. And so, um, yeah, over the years we've ebbed and flowed in the size of the company. But like you say, we're now kind of, I think coming to terms with 
the size that we want to be, which is a team of four, and kind of all play the roles that we play and have made the decision that we're we're now, if we're going to bring other people onto the team, another big rule for us is that we want to be the stupidest people on set on any given shoot that we're on. Like that's best case scenario for us is that the people that we surround ourselves with are so much more established and just like so much better at the whole process than what we are. Cause that's going to be like that fast track to getting better, right? Like there's no, no ego or no desire to feel rad because who cares, right? Rather be the small fish in the big pond for sure. Um, so in terms of that, that's really interesting because I think a lot of, uh, a lot of managers and a lot of entrepreneurs really fear surrounding themselves with people that are better than them in a way because it makes them look bad, but you've embraced this. This is something that's important to you. For sure. Yeah. I mean, actually I was coming back to LinkedIn a little bit. I put up a post just the other day about, um, I was down in Arizona last for two, for the last two weeks. And my dad, I'm fortunate he has a place down there. So my wife and I went down and, um, I'm also very fortunate. I have two dirt bikes. So in, uh, October, November of last year, I sent one of the bikes down to Arizona with this whole grandioso scheme that I was going to fly to Arizona <laughs> and then be able to ride my bike down there. And I was able to pull, pull it all off. And, um, I ended up, my goal when getting down there was I wanted to ride with people who are like infinitely better than me. Um, yeah, locally, I would say I'm, I'm kind of one of the top people here, but like literally big whoop, it does not matter at all. <laughs> Um, but I wanted to ride with people who were just like professional dirt bike riders. Cause that's a thing. And you know, I'm Joe Schmo. And so I was lucky enough to, to link up with a couple guys who this is their job, right? They wake up every morning, they train, they go work out, they eat healthy and they ride their dirt bikes at an incredibly high level. And that was probably the coolest thing that I could have done. Cause I totally could have went down there, linked up with like some like average joes and been like yeah look at how rad i am look at me you know and especially too like with a bit of an instagram because that that my instagram is definitely like it's built around my dirt biking it's not at all they very rarely talk about what it is i do professionally i have a bit of a like status to uphold there where Mm -hmm. i i need to make myself vulnerable to be like hey look at this guy with all these followers like he's maybe not as good as it's portrayed online Anyway, long story short, linked up with these guys and absolutely got my ass handed to me. Like um, the first the first two days of training with them, they're in the heat of preparing for the actual like national series down there. And um, they have a couple training loops that they were doing and they could do a loop in about 20 minutes and it would take me about 45 to an hour. And you're just wow. like, absolutely, your heart is beating at an all time high. You're like, there's a thing in dirt biking called arm pump where essentially like the lactic acid in your forearms builds up and the blood can't come in and out fast enough. So they just turn to like rocks in your arm and your hands don't work. So I'm like arm pump and I never get arm pump here because I'm always riding with people where I'm the top dog, right? So you're kind of always riding at a bit of a chiller pace, right? And so being able to be the worst person there instantly elevated my understanding of like where the bar could be. And I think that's the same thing that we're trying to do with the business is we, we know the way that we do things and this is our bar of where things should be. But if you can bring someone in and just elevate that bar, like way up above where you're operating, that's so much better of a opportunity, you know, coming back to, I want to look in six months and be like cringing at what we were making versus be like, yeah, no, we're still awesome. It's like, no, make it so that every six months you're taking a huge, huge leap forward. And it's kind of my job to be putting the pieces in place to be doing that, you know? Yeah. Surround yourself with, with great talent and you're going to get better. They also say, you know, if you're ever in, if you're ever the smartest person in the room for too many days, you're in the wrong room. Right. So I I love that. So, uh, Six Sigma. Yeah. How did that name come about? So in second year of finance uh, up at university, we learned about the process of Six Sigma manufacturing ideology, uh, which kind of ties into Motorola actually developed it in the, the late 80s. And it kind of has to do with the, the bell curve and the idea of at the Six Sigma of that bell curve, you reach a point where you essentially are manufacturing with next to no errors or emissions. 
in the end, I was like, Six Sigma sounds rad. And we just started to put it, we started to kind of like call our skiing crew, like Six Sigma. Like we made this really, really bad logo and we would put it at the end of all of our ski edits. Yeah. And so then it kind of just turned in, like when it came time to register the company, it was like such a natural progression of like, yeah, that's what we're going to call ourselves. So that's, that's very cool. Yeah. Uh, you had a lot of amazing uh, quotes here today and, and I really appreciate your time. Um, is there anything you'd like the listeners to know uh, or any last minute thoughts you'd like to leave with people before we end? No, I think the thing that's funny, I was thinking about this before coming here today is that if somebody, if I have this conversation with, you know, someone else in town, another entrepreneur or whatever, depending on literally probably like the week that you catch me, you're getting not necessarily a different Jason, but you're getting somebody who's prioritizing things very differently. Cause I'm con- we're constantly like with the business in this state of flux and, and kind of like, yeah, I'm always, I'm always thinking about something new that's most relevant to the things that we're dealing with in that moment. Um, so yeah, hopefully some of the stuff that we talked about is relevant on a, on a larger scale, but, um, at the same time, I think it's funny. We probably could have done this a month from now and some project that's stressing me out isn't happening anymore. And I, maybe I'm completely prioritizing something completely different, but I think it's maybe it comes back to, this is me safeguarding myself by saying, look at how self-aware I am. (laughs) Yeah. I think not being uh, judgmental about yourself understanding that we are all going through crazy things in our lives at all different times. And, and then, you know, feeling vulnerable enough to be able to share that with the world. I think those are all extremely important messages. Uh, where can people find you if uh, they'd like to learn more about you or your dirt biking or Six Sigma? Yeah. So uh, Six Sigma is, you could just kind of Google us. Um, I think at this point we spell it we always joke with people that we spell it stupid so that we could struggle for the next 10 years trying to give people our email addresses. <laughs> but it's spelled like six, like the number six, I-X, Sigma. Um, yeah, if you search it any other Six Sigma Prince Droid, you'll find it. Uh, my Instagram account personally is, is in no way famous, which boils back to a very bad joke from 10 years ago that <laughs> I just live with now. Uh, and then I think LinkedIn is a really good place as well. If people wanted to reach out and connect on, on LinkedIn, just Jason Hamburg on there. Cause I spend a lot of time on there. I do think it's like a super, super valuable platform, especially as somebody who's running like that, uh, that business to business type, type, uh, situation. There's a lot of value in it for me. So happy to chat with people on there as well. Amazing. Jason, I really appreciate your time. Uh, you've uh, dropped a ton of value bombs here. And uh, really excited uh, to get to know you more over the next few years. Um, uh, Everyone, thank you so much for listening to You Sip, I Sip. And uh, we'll see you next time. Thank you for listening to You Sip, I Sip. Please hit the five-star rating and leave us a review. If you'd like to learn more about Northern Lights Winery, text us at 604-670-4046. Or visit us on social media at Northern Lights Winery.